One of the interesting things about deep learning algorithms is that we've seen masses of potential. We've seen lots of papers from uh, really eminent physicians and scientists talking about the potential deep learning can bring. However, there is still a chiasm that Piers Keane uh, described so well in our symposium between the potential impact of deep learning and the actual clinical application. So to date, there isn't a widespread use of uh, the deep learning applications in a way that we've been discussing in our symposiums. And that is, I think, one of the challenges that we need to try and bridge over the next few years. In terms of the uh, currently available OCT devices, rather than limitations of the devices itself, I think the limitations are more around our knowledge and interpretation of the images that they show. Most clinicians have been blown away really over the last few years about the incremental improvements in quality and extent of the imaging and the level of quality of images. But we are still catching up with um, trying to work out how this relates back to clinical practice. So the images, for example, in OCTA provide us with incredible detail of vascular, uh, vasculature but we still don't know fully how that relates to clinical practice and how we should utilize that. So the limitations, I think, are more from the clinical side of interpretation of the data rather than the fantastic images we are able to get. So one of the first take-home messages was that we as clinicians need to think beyond the media image of artificial intelligence as this all-encompassing supreme magical power. In essence, it's about mathematical modelling and what I wanted to demonstrate was that it has its own limitations and it has its own flaws and anybody involved needs to be aware of those. Sure, it could and will, I think, lead to really useful uh, implementation in clinical practice. But we just need to bear in mind that there are other forms of artificial intelligence. It's not just about the deep learning that we see in neural networks, but there are other forms of artificial intelligence, including incorporating expert systems or mathematical modeling uh, that I demonstrated in my talk today. I think this is something that was really nicely covered by uh, Konstantinos Balaskas and Adnan Tefail in our symposium. They talked about the, the massive area of artificial intelligence and how essentially producing an algorithm was only the first step in, in, the, in the long pathway to it being integrated into clinical practice. <clears throat> Adnan demonstrated, for example, that we already have algorithms that would be very good for diabetic retinopathy screening but there is still a long way to go uh, in terms of being able to implement it into clinical practice. And there are a variety of different steps involving the validation through proper controlled clinical trials and then approvals in healthcare systems and working out ways that those can be incorporated then into clinical practice. And all those steps are now the areas I think we need to be concentrating on in terms of being able to gain finally some clinical advantage from the uh, modern AI systems.